So welcome back, everybody. We continue the exciting ANH Academy Week program, and it's my pleasure to introduce the Pakistan panel session. My name is John McDermott, and I'm the director of the CGR Research Program on Agriculture for Nutrition and Health, A4NH. The A4NH program has been a co-organizer of the Academy Week since it began, supporting the LSHTM IMANA organizers. We have a large portfolio of research with national partners in Asia and Africa on agriculture, nutrition, and health programs and policies and food systems for healthier diets. Now some general housekeeping rules. This session will be recorded and posted on the ANH Academy website following the conference. All participants have been muted, but please introduce yourself using the chat. Let us know your name, where you're joining us from, and the organization you work with. Later in this session, we'll open up the conversation with a Q&A session. We encourage you to participate in this and please use the Q&A function to contribute questions for the panel. Since 2016, the Academy Week has rotated between Africa and Asia to support increased participation in these regions. As Joe mentioned yesterday, during the pandemic, the ANH Academy team has worked hard to enhance the benefits of our online presence, but we sorely miss the face-to-face -face interactions. This is particularly true of the interactions with the partners in the Academy Week hosting countries, from research and policy leaders and the many young researchers and students. For this session, I encourage you to imagine that we are in Pakistan with our Pakistan hosts who have organized this panel to showcase their important new ANH evidence and lessons learned. The panel will be chaired by Nicola Lowe. Nicola is Professor of Nutritional Scientists, Sciences at the University of Central Lancashire in the UK. She's worked for many years with partners in Pakistan, both in research on micronutrient deficiencies and community development initiatives, initiatives in Northwest Pakistan. So over to you, Nicola. Thank you, John. Assalamu alaikum to our colleagues in, in Pakistan. And good morning, afternoon, good evening to all of our participants from around the world. I'm really delighted to be chairing this plenary session, which promises to be very exciting and informative and a topic that's very close to my heart. As John has said, I've been collaborating with colleagues on nutrition projects in Pakistan for many years. We have three speakers today, all of whom are based in Pakistan. We have Dr. Atif Habib from the Aga Khan University, Dr. Aisha Kiran from the University of Agriculture in Faisalabad, and Mr. Harris Gazdar from the Collective for Social Science Research in Karachi. Each of our speakers will have 12 minutes to give their presentation. And after we've heard all three speak, we will then open for questions and answers, which will last 20 minutes. Please do write your questions in the chat box as we go along. These will be collated by uh, the team behind the scenes. And then at the end, I will pose them to our panel members. So I hope that sounds like a good plan. So without much further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker. Dr. Atif Habib is a public health researcher who works at the Center of Excellence in Women and Child Health at the Aga Khan University and presently holds the position of Director, Projects and Assistant Professor Research. Dr. Habib has been interested in maternal, neonatal and child health issues, especially those related to nutrition and survival. He's been actively involved in multiple projects, which range from large population based surveys to clinical trials. The evidence collected through his research has been translated into policy and curriculum revisions at different international avenues. The title of his presentation today is Nutrition and Food Security in Pakistan, Challenges and Opportunities for Multi-Sectoral Interactions. So I'll hand over to Atif now, thank you. 
Uh, thanks a lot, Nikki, for uh, such a uh, uh, great introduction. Uh, so I would like to, I would like now uh, share my screen uh, uh, to give my presentation. So can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, uh, so as uh, um, uh, um, Nikki has uh, uh, already told that uh, uh, today I will be presenting uh, uh, nutrition in Pakistan challenges and opportunities, uh, which are the basically insights from the National Nutrition Survey uh, in 2018, uh, which we conducted uh, in collaboration with the, uh, the Ministry of National Health Services Regulation and Coordination, uh, UNICEF, and obviously with the support of Pakistan Bureau of Statistics for the uh, sampling frame and Pakistan Council for Research and Water Resources for our water analysis. So in my today's presentation, I will be discussing with you the design and scale of the National Nutrition Survey very briefly. Uh, then I will uh, take you through uh, some key findings, which will be five takeaways for you, which are related to childhood uh, nutrition rates and differentials. Uh, then the close link between maternal and child nutrition in Pakistan. Uh, then the opportunities to improve uh, the infant and young child nutrition, uh, primary care program and nutrition, the current uh, and emerging triple burden and macronutrient deficiencies in Pakistan. And finally, uh, I will leave you with key, uh, uh, the, uh, the five key actions to address the context of uh, uh, the sustainable development goals in Pakistan. So uh, if we look at the design of the survey, we conducted a cross-sectional survey using the mixed method approach, uh, both qualitative and quantitative data collections were done. Uh, this survey uh, has been the largest ever nutrition survey conducted in Pakistan. And we conducted this in all areas of Pakistan, including Gilgit Baltistan and uh, Azad Jammu, Jammu and Kashmir. The total size, the sample size of the survey was about 115,600 households that provided us the district level representation. Uh, women of reproductive age group 15 to 59 years, children under five years and adolescents were the sample population. Data was collected on nutritional indication, indicators as well as those which can influence the nutrition. Blood samples were collected for hemoglobin, ferritin, vitamin A, zinc, and vitamin D deficiencies. And the results of these uh, uh, values were adjusted for inflammatory markers of CRP and AGP. We also uh, conducted a water quality assessment, both for the microbiological and uh, chemical contaminations. Uh, so as you all are aware uh, that malnutrition in Pakistan has been a long standing pro problem and childhood malnutrition rates haven't changed much in over 50 years. So if you look at this slide, you can clearly see that the rates of stunting, wasting and, and underweight haven't been changed remarkably. The decline in the indicators is not sig significant and Pakistan is still sitting at 40% for stunting, 29% for underweight, and 17% for wasting. So uh, this slide is showing us national averages and that, that masks the tremendous disparities and subnational differentials, as you can recognize from the map that stunting is more prevalent among the districts of Sindh, Balochistan, and Southern Punjab, and in the Northern part of the Pakistan, which is Gilgit Baltistan. The next figure on the slide shows you the region-wise stunting prevalence in Pakistan and global average, which is 22%. And it can be clearly seen that the stunting prevalence in various areas of Pakistan is significantly higher than the global average. So the data on wasting is pretty much uh, the same as of stunting, with most burden coming from say, Pakistan and Southern Punjab. And we, when we, we look at the data on combined wasting and stunting, uh, which is the most uh, egregious form of malnutrition and burden is substantial and have similar distribution among regions of wasting. Uh, the next finding is about the close correlation between the maternal and early child nutrition. 
Uh, in this slide, uh, you can see the association between maternal nutrition and birth and child outcomes. And we are showing you the indicators of low birth weight, stunting, wasting, and underweight. And it can clearly be seen that likelihood of developing low birth weight, stunting, wasting, and underweight, it's just significantly higher in those cases where mother was underweight. Uh, when looking at the district-wise data on underweight among women and stunting, we can clearly see that the districts where underweight among women prevails, stunting rates are high compared to the districts where the prevalence of underweight among the blue area is low. Thus displaying that the maternal and child nutrition are interrelated. Uh, the infant and young, young, young child feeding practices holds a key role in child nutrition and development. And by looking at the data, uh, from the NMSP, we can see that there is an enormous opportunity of improving in this area. Uh, here you can see uh, that the NNS data showed that the exclusive breastfeeding rates declines from birth up to five months. And by the end of five months, only 29% of the children were exclusively breastfed. We can also see that there is a wide variation in specific breastfeeding status by province. And there have been a large proportions of children in each province or regions where children were even not breastfed at all. Uh, this slide is showing you the data on minimum dietary diversity among six to 23 months, which is a key indicator of IYCF. And we can see that the prevalence of those uh, districts with low dietary diversity is quite high and has been widely spread all over Pakistan thus becoming a contributing factor for undernutrition among children. Uh, I would further like to emphasize that uh, uh, and, and address, underscore that the primary care matters a lot for the improvement of nutrition, but you know that the coverage and quality of the intervention plays a very important part. And when we look at the data of the antenatal care coverage and subsequent impact on various nutrition indicators, the data showed that the likelihood of having low birth weight, stunting, wasting, underweight, and combined stunting and wasting is high among those children whose mother had no or only one antenatal care visit compared to those who had four plus antenatal care visits. Uh, this slide is showing you the link between the iron folic acid intake, intake during pregnancy and child undernutrition. And we can see that the chances of becoming undernourished are high among those children where mother did not take the iron folic acid supplementation during pregnancy. Uh, furthermore, Pakistan is now facing a triple burden of malnutrition and we are seeing undernutrition, overweight, obesity and micronutrient deficiencies. Uh, this slide is displaying the data on nutrition status among WRA, and we can clearly see that under nutrition and obesity are going hand in hand in almost every province and region of Pakistan. Uh, and when looking at the data of the micronutrient deficiencies, we can see an alarming situation that most of the micronutrients, like including anemia, iron deficiency, anemia, vitamin A, and vitamin D deficiencies, are. Are, are, are pretty much prevalent. Uh, uh, we can also see that the prevalence of micronutrient deficiencies are widespread. The slide is showing you the distribution of anemia and iron deficiency in anemia in Pakistan. And you can uh, recognize it's been widely uh, uh, spread all over uh, in all regions and districts of Pakistan. Uh, when looking at the data on anemia in various socioeconomic sections, it can also be recognized that anemia is also widespread both in urban and rural population and among the relatively affluent. And here you can see the data on the association between malnutrition and food insecurity. And we can clearly see that the rates of wasting, stunting and underweight are higher in food insecure houses compared to those who are not food secure. So finally, based on uh, the key findings of the NNS, I would like to conclude my talk uh, with the following take home messages. Uh, the first one is maternal and child nutrition in Pakistan is multifactorial in origin. 
and related to complex socioeconomic, cultural, and behavioral determinants, as well as environmental risk factors and food systems. While populations living in extreme poverty and food insecurity are greater risk, malnutrition in, its, in all its forms cuts across the socioeconomic strata. Pakistan burden of malnutrition with coexisting undernutrition, emerging issues of obesity and ubiquitous micronutrient deficiencies. These are major risks to Pakistan human capital. Uh, we have the data that we need. Addressing these issues will need concerted action and political will to address inequities, target populations at risk and multi-sectoral approaches. And finally, we need a national nutrition action plan nested firmly within the provinces and owned by all sectors with the health and multi-sectoral nutrition programs playing a key role. And I would like to thank you, thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Atif, for an interesting presentation. And this leads nicely into our second speaker today, Dr. Aisha Kiran. Aisha, Aisha is working as an assistant professor at the University of Agriculture in Faisalabad. She has a PhD in natural sciences from Justice Leiberg University in Germany and joined the University of Agriculture in Faisalabad in 2015. Currently, Aisha's research group has multiple fo focuses, including crop biofortification, understanding mechanisms involved in the uptake, translocation, and assimilation of nutrients, especially iron, zinc, nitrogen, and optimizing root system phenotyping in different crops under saline, drought, and nutrient variable conditions. Dr. Aisha is also the co-lead in the UKRI supported South Asian Nitrogen Hub with a focus on genetics of nitrogen use uh, efficiency. So thank you very much. I will now hand over to Aisha. Uh, thank you very much, Nicola. Uh, I think Dr. Atif, you have to stop sharing your screen so I can share my one. Hey, doctor. Yeah, okay. In just a moment. Okay. Yeah, you can see my screen, Nicola. Yes, we can. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thanks a lot to ANH Academy to give me this opportunity. And um, after uh, uh, listening to a very detailed uh, information from Dr. Atif, I will talk about here um, agriculture interventions to and the malnutrition challenges faced by the Pakistan and some of the policy perspectives. Okay, and these are the contents of my talk. And if we are looking on the agricultural targets, so the sustainable developmental goals gave the responsibility to the agriculture sector for the food availability and also the uh, devising a sustainable system for the food availability. So if we look that um, these two aspects are really made the target somehow. But if we look on the uh, next two targets given on the nutritional quality, uh, which ultimately um, affect the health improvement, these two are uh, somehow the neglected one. So if we uh, see, uh, I will just highlight some of the, my related nutritional scenario in Pakistan from the nutritional National Nutritional Survey in 2018. We can see here that uh, the malnutrition is really prevalent in the children. That 28.9% are underweight. And we can also see that almost the 54% of the children, they are anemic. 
And uh, we are also looking here that the prevalence of the vitamin D and iron and zinc deficiency is also prevalent in the children. And the women in the reproductive age, they are also deficient in iron and zinc. And if we see, look on the prevalence of the malnutrition, uh, somehow the similar trend we can see in both of the genders. And ultimately, this functional disability and also the trends in the stunted growth, we can see here in both of the genders. So Pakistan stands at 24.6 in the global hunger index. It's reducing, if we see from the 2000, but uh, we can see also that only the 3.6% of the population have the minimum acceptable diet. So if we look on the reasons of the micronutrient malnutrition, we see that the cereal crops, they have the main burden of the total calorie supply in Pakistan. We have uh, approximately 48% per capita. We have wheat, our staple food, and rice and maize, they are sporting it. And for the cereals, if we see that the cereals, they are genetically have low concentration of the micronutrients and there are some anti-nutrients like phytates, they are also decreasing the bioavailability of these minerals. And definitely the soil nutrient depletion, the soil health and also the climatic and environmental variations, they are also the factors which are responsible for the micronutrient deficiency in the um, agriculture product. So the dilution of the micronutrients somehow also through the breeding program when we are really focusing on the high yielding cultivars. And there are also the socioeconomic practices which are affecting the micronutrient availability. If we look on the interventions to combat the micronutrient malnutrition, we see that the strategies which we can follow for the improvement of the micronutrients in human, that the diet diversification for the diet diversification, if we look on this survey results that only the 14.2% people have the access to a diverse diet. And if we look on the food fortification and food supplements, it sounds like uh, expensive to a poor resource person. So the biofortification, biofortified food is really a promising aspect. If we look for the biofortified food or biofortification of the staple crops, it looks a sustainable approach. It really targets the poor people that like and the rural based. And it's a cost effective approach that we uh, really can have the results, long term results, long like the investment will be the long term effect, low recurrent uh, costs. So the Harvest Plus released the biofortified crops map. We look here that uh, around the globe, the people are working on the biofortification of the crops. There are many different crops in different countries are reported here. And uh, these uh, um, biofortified crops are ultimately giving results, giving the nutritional quality and also the impacts of the um, The, on the population. Uh, in Harvest Plus also give the biofortification priority index. And here we can also see that the zinc wheat, like wheat is our top priority anyway, and with um, other crops. And here uh, we also see that the two of the varieties, the wheat varieties, which are high in the zinc contents are released, already released. and and many other crops along with the um, cereals, dry maize and rice are under consideration for the biofortification. So here I, I would like you to see that uh, if we look on the old and new varieties for the zinc concentration with the increase in the yield of the variety, 
we can see the chronological order of the release of the varieties here. The yield was really optimistic, optimized in a sense, but the zinc concentration was low if we see that till the uh, 2010. But uh, in the last two decades, it was focused to have the um, uh, like the biofortified varieties, which are high in the zinc. As we see here, the name zinc coal, and also in India, the zinc shakti. That these biofortified uh, varieties they are commercially uh, released, and they are higher in the zinc concentration, and as well as they are competing the yield of uh, along with the other varieties, commercial varieties. In a recent uh, uh, study just released this month, we have a deep insight of the historical wheat cultivars released in Pakistan. In this study, the, uh, they used the 62 varieties. They were released in the three breeding periods. You, we can see here in this PCA, the grouping of these uh, cultivars. And um, this uh, clustering is based on the SNP markers. And ultimately, when we look on this uh, 62 cultivars group, which is really presenting the genotypic makeup of our germ plasm, we see that uh, the improvement in the yield is really not translated with the improvement in the micronutrient availability. So, but it's really a good study which gave us the mm, basics, which are, provide the basis for the further breeding programs. In one of the recent study, we also got the strong correlation between the iron and zinc in soil and also this iron and zinc in wheat grain and their deficiency prevalence in the human population, which is uh, native to that area. It is also a survey-based study. And we found that uh, if the soil is already depleted from these micronutrients, it will ultimately uh, become a limitation for the grains and also the, as I told you that the main calorie taking is from the uh, cereals in Pakistan. So we really need to focus on the uh, biofortification of the crops. So all of this, which I have presented here is through the collaborations with Pakistan Agriculture Research Council and also the public universities, researchers here, research institutes, and even the, our graduate students who involve them in research and through the competitive research grants, initiative was taken for the Harvest Plus and these all findings somehow success stories also are through the uh, these uh, collaborations. So uh, I think that we, uh, there are the collaborations, there are the uh, focus on the crop biofortification, but we need to multiply them. We need to have the, um, more focus, like more uh, administrative approach for this. So if we uh, look on the strategies where we really need the government policies that we, to combat this malnutrition, we will see that uh, we should have a national level augmentation to these biofortification programs. We need to have strengthening institutional and policy environments for not only the food quality, but also the soil health. We need uh, agriculture research and extension focused on the soil health and uh, specialty crop research initiatives for the quality product and for the long-term solutions and with the day-by-day -day change and climatic uh, issues. And we need a long-term focused program based on the breeding genetics and supplemented with the omics approaches. So if we uh, have to move to the nutrition secure future, we need a multi-sectoral collaboration, multi-sectoral network with the agricultural linkages for the hand-to-hand -hand welfare, which uh, um, there must be the structural transformations, capacity and leadership 
in most of the agriculture institution, we need it to avoid the repetition of the initial level studies to get to the scientific depth. And therefore we need a continuous biofortification program for the sustainable development in malnutrition depending upon the needs of the coming times. I'm really thankful for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Aisha. It's really good to hear about the potential for biofortification as a sustainable solution to micronutrient deficiencies. And, and we'll look forward to, to talking more about that in the Q&A session. Yeah. So uh, thank you. Uh, 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 now it's time to move on to our third and final speaker for this session, Harris Gazdar, who is director and senior researcher at the Collective for Social Science Research, an independent academic and policy research organization in Karachi, Pakistan. He's contributed widely to social science research and policy debates uh, in Pakistan and elsewhere, and has talked as well as conducted academic research in the UK, India, and Pakistan. His research interests include poverty, social policy, agriculture, nutrition, gender, and political economy. His recent research on women agricultural work has influenced legislative and, and policy action in, pa in Pakistan. He currently serves as a coordinator on the social protection to the Chief Minister of Sindh province and is leading the design and rollout of social protection systems and programs in the province, including those for agricultural workers. The title of his presentation today is The Missing Link Between Agriculture and Nutrition, Evidence in Action. So I'd like to hand over to Harris. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um... I have slightly changed the title of the talk. It's now research to note and policy. I'll say a little bit about that. It actually, this conference has played an important role in the work that I'm presenting. Um, it started with uh, work under a consortium called NANSA, which was leveraging agriculture for nutrition in South Asia. We were looking at pathways from agriculture to nutrition. And uh, this is just a simplified depiction of the famous UNICEF framework focusing on household socioeconomic status, education, childcare, and the nutrition on the other side, food consumption and mother's health. And as you can see, um, we can quite easily interact agriculture with this. So if ag agricultural households, their production, their food consumption for their incomes. And so this framework was being used to identify pathways as well as disconnects between agriculture and nutrition. One of the things that we uh, looked at very carefully from the very start was that uh, an important disconnect that a lot of people were missing was that of labor women. Over 75% of the female workforce in Pakistan is in agriculture and over 50% of agricultural workers are women. And there are many different ways of measuring uh, women's contribution to the workforce. And some of the more uh, sophisticated methods that probe activities performed and then, and rather than ask questions about whether work was done, they yield very high numbers for women workers. So even labor force participation rates change very rapidly if you ask a different question. So a lot of the work that I've uh, put in my presentation is uh, available in different places and I have provided links here. So, so this was an important thing. So in this, on this map, we decided to put women's work and then to ask questions about how that actually influences different outcomes. We were working um, with colleagues and you know, there's a lot of work which has already been done. And since this work and as part of this work, this area has actually become into its own. So in any case, once we started putting women's work in the middle of this, it was important to ask what the relationship was between women's work and food consumption, women's work and women's health women's work and childcare, and then all of those things uh, with respect to child nutrition. The, uh, we were very fortunate to form a very, very productive collaboration with a team at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And we were building on qualitative research and very quickly were able to design 
a quantitative survey, a very efficient survey, I should say, with, uh, which represented irrigated areas of rural SIN. And we, a unique survey in some ways, because we recruited over 1,000 mother-child dyads. Now, why was that important? Because a lot of the surveys in Pakistan are unable to, uh, you know, gain a level of precision because age reporting, the reporting of birth dates or recording of births is very, very poor, very, very inadequate. So we basically recruited um, mother-child dialects when the child was between two to four, 12 weeks old, and then conducted an end line with the same cohort about 11 months later. So we have the opportunity of seeing how things change with the same cohort and uh, in different socioeconomic conditions. So there was a lot of precision in age profile. Now certain headlines, some headline findings, um, we have questions in the survey about food security, you know, the standard food insecurity experience scale. And I would like to direct your attention to, uh, firstly, just the high prevalence of households having uh, food, households being food insecure. So the number of the proportion of households who said that they worried about not having enough to eat in the last 30 days. So uh, about 60% in both the baseline period and the end line period. And very closely correlated with the wealth quintiles. So if you ask, well, uh, if you were amongst the poorest quintile, if you're in the poorest quintile, you were actually extremely food insecure in both periods, in both the baseline and the end line. So it wasn't just a seasonal effect, it was something which is quite chronic. And if you were amongst the poorest, you were actually very unlikely to be food secure in both the periods. We, the main, main question, which was around women's work. So we were able to ask a lot of questions through probing. And what was interesting was that we were able to see what women did, what kinds of agricultural activities they were involved in uh, during pregnancy and also then after, after giving birth. And a number of these activities stood out from our qualitative research as being important. Of course, a lot of the work women do is in livestock rearing, but these particular activities were seen to be relatively heavy work, which, and it was important that a number of these activities like cotton picking persevered through uh, the period of pregnancy and soon after childbirth. Now, um, the big, and kind of figures um, and how, why this, this survey is adding to the, adding some value apart from the analysis, even in the pure descriptives with respect to uh, what stunting looks like. So as I mentioned, we were able to um, enroll mother-child dyads when the child was very young. So an infant of between two to 14 to uh, four, 12 weeks. So even at that young age, so in the baseline, the proportion of children who were stunted was about 45%. And in the end line, which was just 11 months after, it was 61%. So clearly, whatever is happening with respect to stunting in rural sin, and rural sin is, as, as you show, see, saw in the first presentation um, on the National Nutrition Survey, it's actually a big repository of uh, poor nutrition. So whatever is happening, a lot of it is actually happening before the child is actually born or just when the child is born. So it's a lot of it is happening with respect to the condition of the woman's health herself. Now, the important findings when we looked at this data, we analyzed them. Uh, and there, were, there are two important papers which came out and I'll just read out the main, um, the key findings and then I want to move on to where what they, what, what they imply for us. So cotton harvesting during pregnancy was negatively associated uh, with maternal BMI and infant length. And then and this happens even if you control for lots of other things like household wealth and education. A lot of those variables are very, very important. And also a lot of the association between uh, cotton harvesting and, and infant length was mediated through maternal BMI. So a lot of this is completely intuitive, but you know we're simply able to put Weight, weight these observations with numbers which are statistically significant. The second paper uh, was looking at catch-up growth. So because we had the opportunity of observing this same cohort over a period of time, 
And just remember, there was no intervention as such. The only interventions were basically things that were happening naturally with respect to women working or not working, their socioeconomic conditions. So that was the source of variation. And we did find uh, you know, so some, uh, some level of catch-up. And the catch-up growth was actually associated with a lot of variables that we we're interested in with respect to care. So apart from things like education and household wealth, which were important, uh, and, and those things will continue to be important. And that's also the evidence globally um, of improvements in nutrition. But what was important and interesting in these rural households in Sin was that if there were more children of a preschool age, then the chances of catch-up growth reduced. Um, if there were more adult women in the household, so a proxy for the provision of care, then the chances of catch-up growth improved. So with all of that, let me move back to the framework and what, what our findings were. And now you see that when we populate this map, there are lots of red arrows, so a lot of things which, are, which have a negative influence. So women's work um, is, the poorer the household, the more likely the woman is to work. So this is, this is a very strong finding. Households, um, women were choosing to work in households where there was a danger of food insecurity. And more educated women were not working in, in agriculture. The relationship between women's work in maternal health was very strong. So the, the more uh, a woman worked uh, in the heavier work she did, especially in cotton picking, for example, the, the worse her BMI was. And of course, then there were lock-on effects on child health. The relationship between women's work and care was also uh, negative. So I want to basically then impose, uh, superimpose, juxtapose that with policy areas. So this whole area between household socioeconomic status and food consumption has to be covered by social protection and food security policies. Uh, you know, uh, behavior change communications and stuff has to happen between education and care. Health, of course, it's towards this, uh, towards the right hand side of the diagram, mother's health and child health, child nutrition and uh, economic growth on the left. And of course, all of it actually, women's work and women's status actually mediates all of it. So, so that's really the critical finding. I don't want to basically come out with a, a finding which confuses us. I don't want to compound all of this because I think we have very, very uh, kind of specific findings as well. But what I do want to um, press home constantly is this very, big importance of uh, making sure that this gap in the middle, this gap represented by women's status, women's work, women's agency, it is central to the analysis. So this is, again, now I've taken off the, the different points where I needed data to prove my point and simply not talk about the policy areas. And then what we've done since then. So one of the things that we've done, managed to do uh, in this situation is to actually get laws passed. A lot of that work was also supported by Lansa in the first part. Uh, we had a very, 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 very fruitful sessions in one of the ANH conferences, the one in Nepal. We were, we were able to uh, do a, plan, a session on this and actually influence policymakers in Pakistan to think very seriously about this issue. And it culminated last year in a law uh, at the provincial level on uh, the recognition of women agricultural workers as workers. It's very, very important. And there are two aspects of this law, uh, which I have written out here, uh, around which we are actually going for implementation. And we have now money uh, in the budget, which has just been passed. One is that the government will maintain a register of women agricultural workers. Now this issue of recognition is extremely important. The second one is a woman agricultural worker shall take time off work due to sickness or for antenatal care and postnatal care routine visits without incurring financial or other penalty. Now, our uh, interpretation of this is that the government is now obliged to support women uh, through a conditional cash transfer if they visit a, a certified health facility for antenatal care and for postnatal care. So basically, we are uh, using this law not only to register women who are agricultural work workers, so create certain avenues for their agency and empowerment, but also to connect them with a social protection system, which is directly linked to their accessing of essential uh, health and nutrition services. 
So uh, that's all I have for now. And I'd like to end here and thank actually the ANH for their contribution uh, to this entire process of going from research to actually certain uh, important achievements with respect to policy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Harris, for another really interesting and important topic on the role of women and, and women's work and the impact on their health uh, and that of the family. Um, we now uh, are open to the question and answer as part of the, of the session. And uh, your questions have been rolling in as we've been going along, and I have a, a nice list of them here. So I'll, I'll work my th way through those, but please do, if you have any further questions, please do feel free to add them to the chat box and we'll try and get to as many as we can in the remaining 10 minutes that we have. So the first question here is a question for Atif and for Harris. And it comes from um, a, a, a group, a, accumulation of, of different participants who are asking about the broader question of how does malnutrition affect pregnancy? Many participants have asked about the relationship between maternal and child malnutrition, including micronutrient deficiencies. For example, low birth weight versus stunting or wasting. Examples have been, did the survey take into consideration or control the effect of child feeding practices, for example, the effect of exclusive breastfeeding or the uptake of folic acid tablets during pregnancy? So that's a question about the relationship between malnutrition and pregnancy. And uh, Atif, uh, would you like to start with that one? All right. <clears throat> yes. Thank you, Nikki. Uh, and this is this is a very important and uh, pertinent question. And we all know that uh, pregnancy and uh, uh, the, the healthcare <clears throat> and uh, uh, the nutrition in the pregnancy is directly related to the birth outcomes. And you know, uh, uh, whatever is happening in the pregnancy, if the if the woman has low birth weight uh, or having low BMI or having anemia, is directly uh, uh, impact on the. Uh, birth outcome, perhaps it can be uh, a premature birth or it, it can be a low birth weight uh, baby or it can be a, uh, a maybe miscarriage or anything like that. You know, uh, right now, uh, most of the uh, people and most of the researchers are now talking about the 1000 days uh, concept in which uh, we are now talking about uh, the holistic uh, uh, care, not only for the uh, women, but also for the children. So uh, the interventions are now going on uh, to incorporate all these stuff. Uh, and and, and, uh, and uh, there is one question about uh, uh, the availability of folic acid during the pregnancy. Yes, uh, the folic acid is uh, is being uh, given as a part of the Pakistan Eliza Blue program. Uh, but uh, there has been issues in, 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 in the uh, coverage as well as the compliance of those folic acid tablets. And we uh, really know that uh, the compliance and the coverage is not good and women are not taking uh, folic acid appropriately. And yes, it is directly related to uh, uh, severe birth outcomes uh, such as uh, uh, premature uh, births and uh, low birth weights. Thank you. And, and are you seeing, um, you mentioned that the, um, the double burden of malnutrition uh, and the increase in, in obesity rates in, in Pakistan. Yeah. Are, you, are you seeing <laughs> micronutrient deficiencies alongside obesity? Yes, uh, yes uh, the, we, we have found the micronutrient deficiencies in obese uh, the children as well as uh, obese women. Uh, I did not present it, uh, that data because you know, the time was uh, short. Uh, the full report of uh, the National Nutrition Survey is available. Uh, it's a 400 page report. And if, if you just hit the Google National Nutrition Survey 2018, you can have the access and you can get the data from there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Aisha, I have a question for you um, from um, yeah. Maria. Uh, the question is, uh, what is the main reason for iron and zinc deficiency among pregnant women in Pakistan. And a secondary question to that is, will the adoption of the Zincol uh, 2019 cultivar fulfill zinc, uh, the zinc requirements and, and address the zinc deficiency? Yeah, uh, for the 
pregnant women if we see that uh, we are uh, in the normal condition we are not taking the optimum optimum diet so uh, in that case when you are also supplier <laughs> to a new baby then i think uh, um, most of the time we don't have exactly the measured amount of all these minerals supplements we are not regularized to getting the supplements and high diet uh, and even uh, in other cases as the dr atif also said that we are not monitoring that how much deficient we are in the iron or zinc or other minerals that's why uh, most of the time the um, babies are suffering for these deficiencies and uh, almost we are more than 80% we are uh, i think anemic in the um, reproductive age so we really need to have the um, to consider the quality of uh, and the mineral um, supply to our, in our diet yes and it's about poor quality uh, diet isn't it and yeah yeah and for the second question i think uh, you are uh, even more uh, <laughs> the person that who can answer that uh, because you showed in your uh, slide in last year webinar that uh, the, definitely the zinc coal adoption uh, is a good thing but there are this is the multi factors that the soil health availability of zinc in the soil and then the uh, availability of zinc in as a foliar spray or some kind of uh, fertilizer is important mm. and definitely mm, when we are processing the mm, uh, flour for mill during the milling with the brown and uh, without brown brown only the endospermic uh, mm, flour all these factors are important to get the optimum amount of the zinc yeah so i think uh, we should have a quality diet we said i should have the quality varieties then uh, the impact of will be minimized mm -hmm. for the malnutrition yes <laughs> thank you that yes I, i can add a little to that from from our own study um we have shown that um with the right fertilizer regime uh, we can double the amount of zinc in the in the zinc coal grain um, the question then is how much of that gets through to the individual and does that alleviate zinc deficiency which was the question as well um, and, I, and i guess we need evidence for that and we are collecting evidence at the moment um, looking at the impact of consuming flour made from the biofortified grain on on zinc status uh, using some novel biomarkers um, so that information will be forthcoming but but yes we des we desperately need evidence to show the effectiveness of of these um, biofortified uh, uh, um, foods to 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 give the evidence to the policymakers for scale up. That's a really important point. Thank you. A question here for um, uh, Harris from Tashin Afzal, who says, "What is the association between malnutrition and social factors?" Um, I guess a lot of our work is really about the social factors. So uh, the one that we have tried to understand is a number of aspects of a household's socioeconomic status plus the work that women do and the care that is available within the household so the important social factor obviously um, in societies like ours is there are patriarchal norms and those norms they shape uh, outcomes as well as processes within households a lot of those norms are uh, internalized in our systems so we expect most of the policy interventions to be undertaken ultimately so, so if you ask who is the actually ultimate vehicle through which a policy intervention for nutrition will be delivered within the household it will be the woman and we don't pay sufficient attention to the existing burdens of work and care on women so i think that the, the our job is basically to uncover a lot of these social factors and to make sure that our policy interventions are uh, they respond to actual conditions in our society and and follow a question for that for you harris was uh, uh, shahid hussain was asking why is, why is there severe malnutrition in rural sindh and what are the policies that are being considered to control it there is obviously um, income poverty and 
because of relatively an, a non-diverse economy, an economy which is really around crop agriculture. And for some, for various reasons, the economy is locked into that. There's a high dependence on irrigation under conditions of uncertainty. So it's actually linked a little bit to what Amitabh Ghosh was saying, that over the last few decades, the supply of irrigation water has declined or has become erratic. There are also high fertility rates. And I think that Sindh is undergoing, it, it will undergo a demographic transition a little bit later than some of the more developed parts of the rural Sindh will go, to under, go through a demographic transition a little bit later than some of the other areas. So a, a big burden of childbirth. And then of course, a lot of crops which are grown where there is a double burden. So there's a lot of burden of work as well as a, a burden of care on women. So a number of these factors are quite significant. Government of course does a lot of things. There is a very elaborate health sector and which is um, uh, in, in my mind, actually uh, we are seeing certain improvements in how primary health is delivered. And of course, some things that governments do well and certain things they don't do so well. But uh, my own area is really social protection. And there we are trying to have very focused programs that can link women and children to uh, existing health services and also to provide them with social protection in order to look after their food security needs. It's a big challenge, but nevertheless, you know, this is where the thinking is. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, we're nearly out of time, so perhaps just time for one more question. And this is this is to all, all of the presenters. And the question is from uh, Nilifa Fatimi, uh, who says, those who deliver guide intervention, how well versed are they on nutrition? This needs attention too. So it's about the, uh, the, the knowledge of those who are guiding interventions and, and making policy or informing policy decisions. Uh, any thoughts on that? How, how good is nutrition knowledge um, in those that make decisions? Anybody like to take that one first? Maybe Atif, have you got a thought on that? If not, Aisha? Yeah, I thought that Dr. Atif is going to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but we can say that uh, that definitely the education is really an important thing. We have the we can have the formal education, we can have the informal education. I'm just saying that the human uh, that nutrition is the like a human nature. Since the birth of a child, you are getting to focus on what is good for him or her. So it's the, like a personal knowledge. And then if you are thinking in a broader way that uh, mm, uh, how the selection of a good quality food is good, uh, will affect on your whole family and then your whole region. It's definitely important. I'm just adding here that I'm talking to, uh, I'm teaching some of the basic courses here and uh, I'm talking to them that if you are looking, if you will talk to your mother, she will add some of other cereals like maize is not so much frequent in our culture now, but it was. And I'm asking that if you are talk about your, with your mother that what else they were eating in their college time or university time. And if you are, will talk about uh, talk to your grandmother, you will get even some of, of more things like the millets and sorghum and also some of the herbs, which are really rare now. We are really have the traditional change. And all of these are somehow replaced with these uh, pasta, noodles, and <laughs> pizzas. It's really looking nice, but definitely we know that it's the nutritional quality we are suffering. It's really important that everyone should have the importance of the diversity. It's not the look of in the diversified food. It's the contents which really, uh, like many of the herbs, we have some of the, our traditional food, like these flax seeds, and also the, um, some of these uh, black seeds like nigella. And, but with the time, we are really 
um, using it very <laughs> rarely now. So I, we are diversifying food in other sense, in a look and availability, but we are reducing the sources. Like we are focused on the wheat and rice most of the time, but we really missed the sorghum, maize and millet and the other things. I hope so that definitely the knowledge at the uh, school level at the we we should emphasize on this knowledge and educating the people that what they are selecting. I'm talking to my students that you are investing on your body till the 30 years. And after 30 years, you will get back. Mm -hmm. You are fascinating with the professors who are really very <laughs> looking healthy and very active. But uh, you will ever see that what's the habit of their eating. So Thank you, really Aisha. I think, I think we'll have to, we could talk all day about I this think, subject. Yeah, I think it's a lot of <laughs> things. Yeah, yeah, I think we'll have, Thank you. have to leave Thank it you. there. But thank you, <laughs> So I think nutrition education from, from childhood all the way through is to adulthood and, 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 and to those making decisions is, is a really important issue. And, yeah. and we could talk forever on that. But thank you. I think thank it's time, you. unfortunately, to close this session. It's been absolutely fantastic. I think you'll agree that um, it's been exciting and informative and still so many questions that we haven't been able to cover so I'm, I'm really sorry for that. Um, this has left us with so much to reflect on regarding the nutritional challenges in Pakistan that are applicable around the globe um, but with correct policy decisions with new research showing how uh, fortification strategies, for example, can be used to help alleviate micronutrient deficiencies. I think we, we have a, a bright future in terms of addressing some of these, these challenges. So as we close, I would like to thank all of our excellent speakers. Um, I've really enjoyed this session. Thank you to all of our participants for their thought provoking questions. Um, also to remind you that the documents relating to this session will be available on the website. Please do look at the online program. We're going to go to a short break now, but please do browse the, uh, the poster hall and visit the virtual spatial zone. And we will take a break and rejoin the thematic panel session in 10 minutes. So we'll see you there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.